Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Derek Anand. I'm excited to have this opportunity to share my research on Lori Frank and her trumpet method with the ITG community. Lori Frank was a New York City freelancer. She came there from Lincoln, Nebraska, and she became one of the most beloved and respected teachers. She was a mentor, she was a trumpet player, she played jazz, she played classical, she did everything. Interestingly enough, her apartment was named 7C. She had a tremendous impact on everyone who came through that door, and I was one of those people. I was fortunate enough to study with Lori during my time at NYU, and I continue to apply her concepts to myself and in my own trumpet studio to this day. My research consisted of the documentation of Lori's system by finding all the students who had her lesson sheets and seeing what was on them. Through this analysis, I discovered all sorts of interesting things about her system and about her method that we previously assumed were different. The goal of this research was to provide a snapshot of how Laurie taught in order to give us greater insight into how we might continue to teach ourselves and our students. This snapshot is valuable because Laurie never published a guide to her system. The only surviving items we have are her manuscripts and her collaboration with John McNeil that we know as Flexus. It's important to note that the proceeds from the sales of Flexus contribute to the Laurie Frank Career Grant, so if you've not already done so, go buy that book, and if you've already bought that book, go and buy it again because that's an important grant. If you would like to see the dissertation that this presentation is based on, please pull out your cell phone and hit up this QR code now. To say that Lori Frank's impact on the trumpet community was large is an understatement. Her impact was incredible. Musicians from all around the world have sought out her guidance, both on and off the trumpet. This graphic shows the global interest in Lori's system, and this interest continues to grow as her teachings became solidified as part of the foundation of trumpet pedagogy. Before we dive in, we must acknowledge Lori's teachers, Dennis Schneider in her hometown of Lincoln, Nebraska, and of course the legendary Carmen Caruso. Information on Dennis can be found in Dr. Louis Eckert's dissertation from 2015 titled, Straight Ahead, The Life, Pedagogy, and Influence of Dennis L. Schneider. Saxophonist Carmine Caruso is perhaps most well known for his book, Musical Calisthenics for Brass. His teachings had a direct impact on Laurie Frank, who was a student of his. Caruso's teaching was a departure from the pedagogy systems of the time, in that it was not focused on the making of music or even of good sound, but rather on the coordination and timing of the body that would ultimately allow for the production of good sound and the focus on musical expression to be unburdened by physical demands or deficiencies. This presentation is not an exploration of the Caruso method, but because of the prevalence of the Caruso methodology in Laurie's teaching, we must acknowledge this approach. The Caruso method is one based on following specific rules and focusing above all else on form. It is important to recognize that Carmine did not mean for this to be a music method. Instead, it trains the body to be reflexive when playing the instrument. As such, quality of sound is not the ultimate goal. This is an example of a departure from traditional pedagogy. As you can see here, these are the four basic Caruso rules. The first rule is concerned with timing. You are to tap your foot at all times in order to provide a source of timing for your body to coordinate around. The second Caruso rule is about breathing, specifically through your nose. The reason for this is that we do not want to disturb the embouchure. We want to train a single embouchure in all registers and we want the lips to touch together before we blow the air. Again, this is the Caruso approach as stated in the text and as taught by Lori. The third rule is to play with abandon. This is to mean that we are to continue to blow air so long as we are using the correct form and there is no pain. If we are blowing air and using the correct form, the results will follow. The final thing to mention is that all additional attacks are breath attacks. These are notated by a little b. This is not the POU attack as with Pierre Thibault, but rather the who or ha attack, so that the lips are blown apart and we can start blowing before we need the sound to sound. This allows us to coordinate our breath to our lips. My research shows that while Laurie approached each student on an individual basis and created a unique solution for each person, the system she used consisted of a very small group of exercises and she was able to scale them to any level. My analysis shows that a typical Frank routine had on average about six different exercises, and that less than 9% of routines would include musical material, that is, items that were not just simple drills. This research found 10 unique exercises that Laura used. Of these 10 exercises, three of them appear in more than 75% of
of the routines we saw. Drills that I call the core exercises of Laurie Frank's system consist of three distinct drills that appear in more than 80% of the routines analyzed. My research conclusively shows that the genius of Laurie Frank was not in the creation of practice material, but rather in the perspective and the prescriptive application and adaptation of a small group of drills that stem from the teachings of Carmine Caruso and also other major established pedagogical species. The core Laurie Frink drills consist of buzzing, the bend study, and the six notes. These always appear in the front one-third of routines. Buzzing is one of the most common exercises and is a preliminary warm-up drill. This drill had the student play something on the lips alone then on the mouthpiece, and then on the trumpet. It was important that this was done in all seven positions on each part. It was frequently seen in the notes as lips, mouthpiece, trumpet, or lips, MPC, TPT. This was in Laurie's distinctive handwriting. The specific form here was to play with a medium, comfortable volume, and to buzz at pitch on the lips, and to aim for an even glissando between all pitches on all three situations. It is interesting to note that this is in contrast to the stamp approach which has us free buzz an octave lower and to move quickly from center to center rather than using the glissando approach. Routines would have between one and four variations of this. Check it out.
A few other things to note were that Laurie didn't have a specific way of holding the mouthpiece. I don't know of very many situations in which she asked the student to adjust how they were holding it in the first place. It's also worth noting that Laurie wanted you to have crescendo plus glissando as you moved between notes. This is similar to James Thompson's method. Six notes is another warm-up type exercise. This is lifted directly from the Caruso method and it's clearly found in musical calisthenics for brass. Laurie used it in the same way that Caruso used it. We needed to have a medium volume and use those Caruso rules the entire way through. As you go through these Caruso exercises, remember, tap your foot, breathe through your nose, and keep the air constant. Many people complain about stiffness when doing Caruso exercises. If you're one of them, then I suggest focus more on blowing long air. As long as air is bringing in relaxation and exhaling tension, then you can't develop any sort of stiffness doing these exercises. It's only when we feel like we have to clench and grip these notes that it doesn't work as well. Bending, otherwise known as the bend study is something that roughly exists in the stamp book as the bending exercise. Frink's version is printed in an early NYU Trumpet Studio course reader called an integrated warm-up, and it consists of four separate drills on each open partial. The form for this drill is to play in time, play the maximum number of measures in one breath, and to use a medium volume while utilizing the glissando approach. You would do this drill on G, then on C, then on E, and then on G on top of the staff for two octaves. It could go beyond that as well.
Now that we've covered the core exercises, I want to talk about the additional drills. These additional seven exercises include the interval study, tongue brushing, nodes, noodles and spiders, harmonics, and pedals plus chromatic. Most students of Lawyer Frank would have experienced all of these exercises at one point or another. It's also important to note that my research found that about 10% of the sheets contain materials other than the 10 exercises mentioned in this presentation. Interval studies is another Caruso drill, and it's taken perfectly from that system. It involves playing a specific diatonic series with intervals into the upper register using the Caruso rules. When no sound comes out of the instrument, you rest for 30 seconds or more, and then pick up where you left off to go higher. This is a high note training system. It allows you to expand your habits further and further into the upper register. It's important to note that the volume should not markedly increase as you get higher. An interval should never lurch. That is, they should never jump. They should move smoothly as if a glissando is being used. It's also vital to note that pedals always follow this exercise as a recovery. Students who graduate to larger and larger intervals. Many would start on thirds as it's hard to really gliss upward the interval of a second. Pedal tones always follow the interval study, some kind of a drill that helped you recover. They were also paired with a chromatic scale that helped you to reset your embouchure to the regular register. A common version of this was bending pedals and chord pedals. Another one was chromatic pedals. With the pedal recovery exercises, Lori would say you didn't have to follow the Caruso rules. It was all about relaxation and reminding the lips that they can vibrate. With the chromatic scale reset, Lori insisted that we play in perfect time and really focus on the turnaround when we get to the top. Try to make it really smooth, even, and nail every note. You could expand this to higher and higher chromatic scale ranges as needed, but always starting low.
Yet another Caruso drill is harmonics. In this exercise, we move from the mid register to the low register, then to the extreme upper register and back down. It's an exercise that's designed to train the body how to play across the full range of the instrument with a single embouchure and with correct air support. We typically do these as high as we went in the interval study of the day, but frequently this drill would exist without the interval study. Don't forget to use the Caruso rules. This is an exercise where it's easy to get carried away. Remember to focus on the form. Tongue brushing is an exercise designed to utilize the inherent efficiency of slurring and combining that with the mechanism of tonguing. We want to be able to tongue with the same ease that we slur. This drill is again lifted from the Caruso system where it's called the develop scale. In addition to the Caruso rules, the form of this drill is to be at a medium volume and to alternate between slurring and tonguing as you ascend and descend. <laughs> When I first met Laurie Frank, I had issues playing low notes. I would open my embouchure up, I would even pull the instrument away. She quickly identified this, 
And one of the therapies that were used to help me attain the low notes with the same setting as the mid register was the exercise called nodes. It's a specific drill for bringing the middle setting into the lower register. We use the Caruso rules here and we want to be totally connected between all the notes with sound so that there's no chance that we can shift the embouchure. We basically slur it downwards, much like a Thompson exercise would. The noodle, or noodles, are a group of exercises that found its way into the Flexus book. It's also worth noting that drills like this one exist in other books that also predate Flexus, and the term noodle is applied to this drill in an integrated warm-up. Indeed, most drills in the trumpet pedagogy world, we find, have their roots somewhere in the Schlossberg book, somewhere or another. You can definitely find this one there. The noodle is an exercise where you train the ability to move air and sound between notes without the use of valves. This is a flexibility exercise, or as Laurie would call it, a quick register change drill. Laurie often would have me use the Caruso rules in this exercise, and sometimes I would tongue the notes, but it's not explicitly shown to use those rules or to articulate in any of the lesson notes. The most important part of the form is to play in time, and to go slowly at first and then double time or faster. This double time relationship is something that is a superpower when practicing on the trumpet. <laughs> Spiders are another exercise that can be seen in the Flexus book. It's titled the same in an integrated warm-up as well. The spider is a drill that expands in opposing directions. Since you're moving larger distances within the same amount of time, we train the body to move the exact amount faster for each change rather than just randomly moving up and down. The form in this drill is to do it all in one breath, to do it in perfect time, and to keep the blow steady. There you go, those are the 10 major exercises. Again, if you're interested in reading more about my research and specifically about these drills, please check out my dissertation on the topic. You'll find lots more information, lots of links to the literature, as well as notated examples in the appendix. If you're still with me, congratulations. You just experienced the primary exercises that Lori Frank employed in her system. I made every effort to showcase how these were taught by Lori, as free as possible for my own personal interpretations. Lori was adamant that students become self-sufficient. It's no surprise that many of her students still do some form of the routine she prescribed to this day. 
It's also no surprise that her students have become able to create their own variations and apply these drills to their own students. I would like to take this time to thank Lori for all that she has done for the trumpet community. I owe my career to her, as I'm sure many others do. We know you are up there smiling at us and shaking your head at our attempts to make sense of it all. Thank you again for tuning in. I hope this was an informative session, and I welcome any feedback and any questions you might have. If you're interested in studying with me, I teach at Boise State University, where we have a dual trumpet studio. Dr. Zach Bowie and I teach a shared studio where students can learn from both teachers simultaneously. This is a unique and valuable setup, much like my experience at NYU when I was studying with both Laurie Frank and Brian Lynch at the same time. Happy practicing, and I hope to see you on the gig.